Hi everyone, welcome to Angular Insights, breaking into your first enterprise IT account with EdSim. Uh, we have a great session planned for you today. Um, so for those who are new to Angular Insights event series, uh, the structure of this event is we'll do the first half will be a presentation led by EdSim, and the second half will be Q&A. Um, we do things a little bit different here. We like taking questions over audio. So if you have a question for Ed, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. And then uh, we will call on you and your mic will be unmuted and you'll be able to ask your question. Uh, since we have a lot of people on the call, please quickly introduce yourself and um, you know, say where, what country you're based in, what company you're from. And uh, we want the session to be really interactive. So please feel free to ask any and all questions you have. And with that, I will pass it over to Gil. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, special thanks to Ed for doing this. Uh, Ed's been a friend and a friend to the firm uh, for a long time. Um, Ed is the founder of Bold Start Ventures, uh, which is a probably the leading uh, B2B infrastructure firm on the East Coast uh, and one of, one of the top ones in the US. Um, uh, more, more importantly, Ed's, Ed's been a real uh, uh, friend and lighthouse as we thought about you know, what we wanna do at Angular and when I was out raising the fund. So first of all, Ed took the time to meet with me and give me some, some, some tips on raising a fund before I even had a fund. And that, that, that means a lot as you all know as founders. Um, and then in, in addition, when LPs would ask me, what do you want Angular to be? I would just, at some point I just started saying, well, we just wanna be the bold start of Europe. That just was the easiest way to explain uh, what we're trying to do. Um, Ed's built a fund that um, really has a focus, uh, deep tech, enterprise, B2B sales. Um, they're known for putting out great content, very thoughtful investments. Um, I'm privileged to be co-invested with Ed personally on two investments, uh, Sneak and Front, uh, but he's also an investor in, in companies you've probably heard of like Superhuman, Big ID, Customer, Security Scorecard, Fortress IQ, and many, many more. Um, Without any further ado, let me introduce Ed and let him uh, take over, and then we look forward to your questions afterwards. Thanks again, Ed. Great. Hey, uh, Ann and Gil, thank you so much. And Gil, um, I've, I've enjoyed working with you and look forward to doing a lot more. And uh, as I like to say, in New York, we feel like it's a great bridge between Europe, Israel, and the West Coast. Uh, and the other wonderful thing about uh, being in New York is that we have 73 Fortune 500 companies, which means um, I and my team end up spending a lot of time uh, with IT executives, heads of cloud, heads of infrastructure, CISOs, et cetera. So this topic on breaking into your first enterprise IT account is quite near and dear to our hearts because we spend a lot of time um, with the founders, uh, wherever they are, helping them kind of land that first, that first one. So uh, I thought this topic could be a little dry, so I thought I'd, I'd liven it up and make it a little fun. And so the one thing I like to say is that um, you know, every successful company that is scaling today had a first customer. And, uh, you know, that could be you. And today I'd like to just explore just ideas or things that we think about. I mean, this is by uh, no means a fully exhaustive approach to it, but just some ideas about how we think about the world. So uh, I want you to just take a quick look and read this slide. Um, this is a friend of mine, Marty Broadback. I've known for 20 years. He used to be the uh, CTO at Pfizer, CTO at Shutterstock, he's a CTO at Priceline now. Uh, I just hosted him on one of our webinars recently. And, um, you know, here's the key is that if you have no customer, you can still get a first customer. And if you see Marty's point here is in certain cases, zero customers are actually better because you have a chance to shape and mold the product based on a set of requirements that comes for your company. So my point here is that, you know, everyone can be a first customer. You just have to find the right one. And we'll kind of explore that right now. Um, I always love this slide, uh, you know, Wonder Woman's a super powerful figure, but you know, the way we think about it is a lot of times we meet with technical founders, because that's what we really invest in is hardcore technical founders who are focused on product vision. Um, they usually think about themselves, right? It's, it's about my tech and this great thing that I'm building. But I think the most important thing that you have to think about before you even reach out to your first enterprise IT customer is, you know, what problem are you solving? Who are you solving it for? And then, you know, how do I discover the pain and the priority of that pain in the organization? And, and when I say this, it's not just I'm looking at a bank. It's not just I'm looking at a developer. It has to be at a super, super granular level. And, you know, it comes down to what person are you really targeting? You know, what is the user persona? And there could be several. 
for example, like Sneak, is it a developer, a dev manager? Is it security, the VP of engineering? You've got to think about it that granularly to get started. And you need to understand what do they do all day? What is their workflow? And ultimately, this is the, the point here, is that how do you make that person a hero in the eyes of their boss? You know, that is the key. So many founders that we back usually have a deep understanding of this pain and the priorities around it because this is something they do every day or they live with it every day um, and they want to solve this problem. So, you know, as I think about that persona, when you think about that persona, the, the other important piece is before you reach out is, is messaging. Messaging really matters. And, you know, I'm a fan of history and I think Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore is an absolute classic. And if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it. And, you know, he goes through that kind of that crossing the chasm with the beachhead and how to reach early majority and early adopters. But the point here is that this is a great framework to think about, you know, your message. And I can't tell you how much time we spend pre and post first check investment on this piece here. And, and the point is, imagine sending one email, one paragraph on what you do and what the value proposition is. What would that be? And uh, so much thought and feedback goes into this. And if you start here, I think it's a great, great a starting point. So for example, for who's your customer? Who, like what problem are you solving and for who? Um, where, it, where does your product fit, you know, in terms of like what aisle, what shelf? It's kind of like, if I know I'm looking for ketchup or mustard, I know to go to the condiment aisle, right? And then within that, you can pick Heinz 57 or Sir Kensington's or some other brand, right? So you have to think about where do you fit so they understand in their minds kind of what budget uh, uh, would they be pulling out of. Um, and then kind of what is it that you do uniquely, right? What is that breakthrough? And you might even want to, I frankly don't want to position against competitors, but you could. Uh, but just remember that that's something that you have to think about when you address later. Um, and then bottom line is this is what we do for you. And so here's an example of a company that we invested in in Israel uh, about nine months ago or 10 months ago. And, you know, it's an infrastructure company. And sometimes it's really hard to explain what you're doing and for who. And this is like our fifth iteration of this template. But if you think about it here, um, you can see some of the messaging. Um, it tells you what it is. It tells you what organizations it's going after. It tells you what it does. Um, it gives you the value prop for DevOps. It gives you the value proposition for testers, support, and sales. Uh, and ultimately kind of what, what the value proposition is for the business. So once again, it, don't take this lightly because this is going to be the key to getting people excited about your product as you reach out. The other thing that's a kind of a trick of the trade and a tool of the trade, and, and this is for any sales process, because, um, you know, I like to invest in companies like free products, like just a slide deck. And I like to say that it's really hard to understand sometimes what the infrastructure is. And I said, you know, I tell founders, like, help people envision the future. Show me the dashboard. Let's work backwards. Show me what it is that you're offering so that I can, I can understand that, hey, you know, this is what I'm going to see. This is what I'm going to use. This is why it's important to me. And then underneath that, you've got the tech sitting behind it. So here's an example of, you know, M0, which I mentioned earlier, just showing what their cost control dashboard looks like and, and how that works. Or on the right is Fortress IQ, which just raised a $30 million uh, Series B round. Uh, and that was their first thing that they showed me and showed their first customer before they even had the product fully built. So I, I, the whole point here is that eye candy works and visualizations work. You can also use Loom videos or demo videos. But the point is visualization really, really helps bring your infrastructure to work, uh, to life. Um, so let's transition now. You got the messaging down. You've got the one paragraph. You have kind of that <laughs> picture um, that you're going to leave in the buyer's mind. And so I'd imagine that a lot of the folks here are probably infrastructure founders, probably some SaaS founders. And so one thing we, we think about is, is a sandwich model. And, you know, there are two ways to kind of find uh, and go find uh, your first enterprise IT account. And that, that can be top down. So you go directly to a senior buyer through relationships, you know, the same way that you might go approach, you know, Guild Angular or myself at Bold Start. Um, you leverage your relationships, your investors, your advisors, a friend of a friend, right? You know, we always like to think about if you can't get to us through a friend of a friend, then how are you going to get to a customer? So that's top down. Uh, the, the, the second piece is bottom up. It's like evangelism. It's content marketing. And, um, you know, the key here is that it takes a long, long time. And, um, you know, the other part that we think about is that when you're actually taking that first check in, 
the time it takes to evangelize a new market or new opportunity, you know, leveraging open source or something, it may be too long before you actually, you know, get to an A round, right? So how do you kind of balance that out? Because unless you're in a massive market with a database market and doing, you know, 100,000 downloads kind of a month or something, it's hard to really get those bottom up metrics. So that's why I think the sandwich theory is pretty interesting, right? You build this uh, evangelism from the bottom and you reach top down to get a few customers so that when you go out and raise your A round, you have some proof points. Um, so I like to say kind of hit them high and hit them low, invest in the long term, but see if you can get some short term wins. Um, you know, now I just think about versus about 15 or 20 years ago or even five years ago, the data is everywhere. So if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, like, I don't know anyone, I don't know how to reach out to anyone. I just, you know, I don't have those relationships. Just, you know, remember that early adopters can be found anywhere. All the speakers that are out there want to be connected with someone, right? And there's a topic, right? So a lot of our companies will go out and let's just say scrape uh, the Kafka summit on the left or hit MongoDB live. That's, that's a customer right there talking about how they're deploying MongoDB. Do a little research on that. Um, you know, look at that speaker list. Uh, they all want to network. The other thing that folks do, let's just say you have a Kubernetes company, scrape LinkedIn, look for all the job postings uh, where they're looking for a Kubernetes hire or Kubernetes expertise, put a list of that together uh, and then start kind of leveraging those uh, emails that I mentioned earlier, kind of that positioning framework to reach out to some of these folks. So the bottom line is just do your work. Job boards are your friend, be scrappy. So once you kind of get their attention, uh, I think the most important point here is, um, you know, you have to actively listen. You know, I mean, too often, I mentioned this earlier, that tech founders only want to talk about their tech. I've got this cool serverless technology and they can go on and on and on about how fast it is and everything else. But, you know, I think you need to rethink um, your approach when you're having conversations with these folks. You need, to, you need to ask questions and think about what is it like if I were in their shoes? How do they make decisions? Um, and from that, try to understand, ask a lot of questions. What are their top problems and why? How much pain is there, right? Because if you're number 10 on that list of priorities, you're never gonna um, you know, crack the code there. Maybe you should move on to another account. Maybe you should think about um, rethinking your value proposition. You know, the bottom line is you have to solve a problem. Don't sell tech. Your tech is that unique insight that enables that. And you know, to that point, um, this is uh, Dean Del Vecchio, who's the CIO of Guardian Life. He keynoted AWS uh, reInvent, I think two years ago with Jassy, talking about how he closed 80, de 80 data centers in three months and moved to AWS. But the point is, is that, you know, Dean says here, do your homework, right? I mean, do the research. It's easy, it's all out there. If you, if you come in and just don't know what you're talking about or don't understand their business, then I think it's, it's a problem. So, that we've talked about messaging, we've talked about how to find some early adopters. Um, you know, now kind of, you know, how do you actually start transitioning into some type of relationship? Uh, and going back to my earlier point, you know, IT buys from people they know or trusted partners. And then you're probably asking yourself, how do I build that trust and rapport if I don't know them or over Zoom? And, you know, I wanna, I wanna just highlight here the first and most important thing, and this is the most important thing as well for any sales process, including you know, reaching out to, to, to VCs. Your goal in that first meeting is to get to the next meeting. It's not to close a VC round, it's not to close a sale. As Marty mentioned earlier in that slide from, from Priceline, don't, don't talk licensing in the first 10 minutes. It'd be the equivalent of talking about you know, valuation with Gil and I you know, in the first 10 minutes of conversation. Don't do that, get to the next meeting and then the next meeting. So how do you build trust? So, you know, they're, they're going to be buying uh, based on you and your ability to solve their problem. The trust kind of in your understanding and that domain expertise and the trust in your ability to build. So my perspective would be, and, and this works pretty well, is, you know, listen, take feedback, iterate on your product, and then come back to them. Show them what you have heard and learned. You're never going to nail it in that first meeting, especially going for that first customer. But if you show that you have the domain expertise, um, if you show that you have velocity, if you show how great your team is and that you listened, do that a couple of times. It might be a couple of iterations where you said, hey, I, I took your feedback. I incorporated some of that in my product. Come back to them another two weeks later. You know, I added that other piece here. Like now let's start talking about stuff, right? Set up Slack channels, offer your phone number for real-time messages. Make them feel comfortable that they're betting on you 
and that you can deliver in a timely fashion. That's the most important thing is because a lot of time these products are half baked. Uh, and, and, and lots of my portfolio companies, I've helped a lot of them get their first customer. It's okay. Half baked stuff is okay, but you have to build that trust and you can deliver and you have velocity and you can build really good software. And that's how you do it. Um, so, um, I think if you look at that prior slide from Dean at, 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 uh, Guardian, he just said the other way to build that relationship is kind of start small, uh, to get bigger, right? Kind of land and expand. And I think the most important thing is you got to narrow the scope. Uh, I see too many times founders come in and get very excited and they try to do too much. Uh, they want to solve everything, right? Enterprises don't from, buy from startups to solve every problem. They buy from startups to solve one problem, a narrow problem that you can do really, really well and better than anyone else. And if it's that constrained, then it's something that's easier to take a bet on. So pick a narrow pay, pain, make it easy to say yes, and then you can always expand that relationship once, it, once you're integrated. Um, the other piece is do it quickly. Uh, think about how do you reduce friction to onboard, right? So it's much easier for a SaaS or, or, or a bottom-up dev tools company for people to try it out and much harder and top-down. So, you know, the one, one thing I would encourage you when you're thinking about top-down is don't require a rip and replace. So maybe think about how do I integrate with the existing systems, even though your long-term strategy might be to replace an existing system. You know, don't require a forklift upgrade and don't require the enterprise to dedicate too many resources to this, right? You don't want them sucking up time. They, they don't have enough engineers. They don't have enough people. How do you actually make them spend less time on your project so that you can do it for them? So, and the final thing I'd say is uh, don't require anything on site, especially in today's world. Um, you know, create deployable VMs, use products like Replicated, which is in our portfolio. Uh, use companies like Tackle.io, which allows you to sit on top of cloud marketplaces. Just find a way and be creative. So this is kind of like the money slide as you think about it. I love this Krusty Krabs kind of uh, piece here. Um, it's hard to compete with free money. Uh, so, so the tried and true question is, you know, do I give it away for free or do I charge for POCs? You know, in a perfect world, uh, I prefer no free OCs, which means charging for the proof of concept. Um, and so, you know, I think having skin in the game uh, from a potential partner, no matter how small a check is, you know, gets their attention, makes them focus on you. And my point is, don't be afraid to ask. Um, you know, and, and by the way, this is more for a top down versus a bottom up sale, right? Because if it's bottom up, then people can try out your product, they can expand it within team. Uh, uh, but, you know, if you're doing bottom up, the only thing I would think about is how do you think about the longer term? How do you convert someone to paying? How do you convert into um, a, a larger team or organization sale? Right. So just think about that perspective. Um, but the bottom line here is you have to think about how do I be a partner for some of these enterprises versus selling to them? Um, I just set up uh, just a few points or thoughts, points of friction that we run into sometimes or founders run into when they're actually talking about or thinking about kind of that POC. Um, the one thing I think about is going back to my point is being narrow and focused, create a statement of work. So usually there's a contract, which is a few pages that spells out kind of the, the legally binding terms, but then in the back, there's a statement of work. And then that statement of work, it could be one pager and you talk about what deliverables you're gonna provide and what the measurable goals are. For example, let's say I'm doing a POC, just on a database, right? Uh, and within 30 days, I'm gonna migrate, you know, X petabytes of data to my data warehouse, and I'm gonna provide, you know, sub-second, sub-millisecond, 100 millisecond functionality for every query, right? So just have something that's measurable and constrained. Um, the second thing I would say is constrain the time as well, right? You know, 30 days or less uh, is key, maybe 60 days at most. And, you know, this is once again for those top-down sales, right? Because um, it, it, these are, higher ticket items, uh, people actually want to do bake-offs and want to try things, but you have to have measurable, clear goals. Um, charge for it. Uh, then the question also is, you know, is there an automatic conversion? Like a lot of times we'll actually think about if I deliver my POC and if I deliver within these values that we both agree on, right? Yeah, this is a business value here, then, you know, I'm going to charge, this is what it's going to cost moving forward. And, and you can maybe flip them into licenses, let's just say for $250,000 and for them being the first customer, you know, give them a discount for a year, not for life, but for one year at least, like maybe give them 30% off, 40% off, 
you know, and then what I would do is probably extract some uh, other value from them. You know, will you be a reference? Can I get a case study from you? You know, can I do a few of these things, right? This is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the big points uh, that are brought up a lot during, during these negotiations. But the statement of work is the most important piece that sometimes people miss, and you can't have it be an open-ended, unmeasurable thing, right? So think about what that means and work with that uh, uh, partner about that. So the bottom line is, when you're actually trying to break into your first enterprise IT account, uh, you notice that this is not about closing your first sale. Nowhere did I mention closing your first sale in this whole um, uh, kind of talk. Uh, the best advice I can give you is don't sell. Think about partnering. You know, we call those enterprise design partnerships. You know, how do you actually get a 25 or 50K check to be a partner for them, right? Maybe you provide some resources. Um, you know, going back to my earlier points, how are you going to make the buyer a hero? How do you prove that you are the one to deliver? And you know, the most important thing here is remember, it's, um, they're making an investment, less the dollars, but more from a resource allocation perspective, right? So you have to think about what people am I reducing for them? You know, how much time am I freeing up for their people? So you gotta really think about it from their shoes. You know, for example, some of our best companies actually started where they sent some engineers on site for two or three weeks, you know, two or three days at a time. They actually even had a badge for that company, right? To actually check into the company for two or three weeks. Uh, and they lived with their engineering teams to, um, to build product. And that further built the relationship. They kind of co-developed the product. Um, and you know, I think the, the important point here is that, don't worry, you're not building custom software because the smartest CTOs know that, hey, zero customers are better, but at the same time, I'm making a bet on you. And um, I know that if I ask you to build custom software for me, then you're not a business. And I need you to be a business because I need you to be around forever, right? So that, that's kind of the, the piece here. So you can find early adopters. We've done it time and time again. Um, and so these are some of the things that we think about. So that, that's it here on my side. Cool, Ed, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I've got two, two questions that come, come to mind immediately while we sort of wait for people to sort of raise their hands. And just as a reminder, um, audience, if you want to ask questions, we'd love to have you just click on the raise your hand um, within the, uh, the participants. Um, uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Um, one question I want to ask you, Ed, is, is just your, your perspective, having done this for a while, how is this sort of art and science of these early enterprise penetrations, how has that changed? You know, if you look at five years ago versus five years from now, how is this changing over time? And, and, and can you reflect on that a little bit? Um, are, are the, are, is the playbook the same or is it evolving? I think it's definitely evolved. Um, I think five, even seven years ago. First of all, I think there's two trends. One is um, the trend of every large company going to invest or breed or one throat to choke. You know, traditionally it was like Microsoft and IBM and Cisco. And now people know that if they want innovation, that the world is moving so fast, they can work with startups. If you ask a CIO or, or CISO or you know, head of infrastructure, they don't check their voicemails. <laughs> they barely check their emails because they're inundated with just marketing messages all the time. So if you talk to them, they'll ask their team, they'll do a Google search, um, right? I mean, so, so the word of mouth, and that, or they'll talk to a friend. So word of mouth marketing is so important. Um, owning kind of, if someone's gonna search a Google term, let's just say, um, infrastructure as code, like owning kind of one of those top three searches, I think is really important because CIOs will just sit at their desk and, 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 and search. And then the third part is, I think, uh, Gil, to your point, uh, particularly for infrastructure startups, I think um, hitting them top down, going back to the sandwich theory, but also having some of their existing um, folks uh, using the product, right? Whether it's open source or something else is, is such a good touch point, right? Because when you, when the CIO asks uh, one of the heads of engineering, if they have heard of this product before, they can say, oh, I love it. You know, lots of us are using it. So, so I think the world is changing um, for the better for, for startups, actually. Is it, would it be too much to say that a lot of the standard, you know, bag carrying sales guy, field sales force playbook just doesn't work anymore in the environment you're describing? Um, I would say that um, it still does work. I mean, look, let's talk about top down versus versus bottom up. On the top down side, I mean, you still need kind of expensive sales folks. I mean, these are big ticket items. I'm talking about, you know, 200K starting point uh, price going up to a million to $3 million. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's still there. 
Um, but I think that also the value of being able to land a, a company and then get to that million or $2 million, I think that's really, really proven. I mean, look at even like a data dog, their expansion numbers are absolutely insane. So m my point is that you don't have to start with a million dollar deal. You can actually still figure out how does your product kind of lead the sale, right? How do you make it easy for your product to get into an organization? And then how do you think about your pricing so that you can actually expand with volume or usage or, or some other metric? Another question also sort of to bring the time dimension to this, you know, you've, you've worked with first time founders, you've worked with repeat founders and you've watched founders grow and evolve into seasoned executives, right? If you were to sort of compare the way a first time founder approaches some of these issues and the way some of the best ones approach these issues, what would you say are the, are the differences? What should, what can be learned from the way that more experienced people do this as we try to ramp up early stage founders, what are some of the mistakes they typically make or the errors that they make that end up costing them a lot of time? Yeah, I would say, and I brought some of it up earlier. Uh, one is, I would say that the ability to tell a story. So honing that messaging down to the value proposition for the end user, I think is so key. And it sounds so trite in a way, but it's probably the most important thing. It's constantly honing every six months. You know, a good exercise may be, Go to the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archives, and just type in a company and look at the messaging on the website over the last five years, right? What did it start with? How did it evolve a year later? How did it evolve a year later? It's really, really interesting and fascinating to see kind of that message. So having the value proposition, not selling tech, is a, is a number one piece. Two is telling a story. Um, you, need, you need to be able to tell a good story going back to that message. And the third point I would say is don't try to sell. If you're trying to get that first kind of you know, IT account, uh, think about how do you partner with them? How do you build that trust, right? Because, you know, first time founders may come in and just try to sell something and they're not listening enough. So those would be the three things that I would say that really, um, you know, flip the, the opportunity uh, right. and, and make it easier for people. It's almost like founders that think that the skill set they're missing is a sales skill set. In some of these cases, that's not even what it is. It's a partnering and listening skill set that's actually going to be the value driver at that phase. Absolutely. Um, one other question, just be, before we open it up, um, what is your view on 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 firing customers for these early stage customers? In other words, we have sometimes you have a company that says, "You know, I I wanted to sell. I've got this great customer success tool, and they're dragging me towards the product engineering team, or I've got this great dev tool, and they're dragging me towards ops. And like, I I have a great logo and a great engagement, and they're even willing to pay me. But what they want to do with my stuff is different than what I'm trying to prove. What is your advice to founders in those cases? And can you give maybe either anonymized or not, maybe some specific examples of some of these more challenging customer relationship issues where you've already invested, you've already, you're already in the door and suddenly they want something different from you than what you thought you were there to do? Yeah, I, I would say that that's a really great question. Um, and I think the most important thing is, is that you need to even say no to a customer before they even become a customer. I think you learn a lot during the process of uh, trying to partner with them and the questions that are asked and who, who is the person that you actually uh, are interfacing with on a daily basis. Um, if the situation does get sticky, um, yeah, you got There are certain companies, by the way, this is why not every enterprise is a great, you know, everyone wants that fortune 500 customer first, but maybe they're not the right one to start with, or they might be too big. Maybe you find a medium sized company that can move faster, like the CTO of a, a thousand person company or, a 1500 person company, not a 20,000 person company, right? Because they can move faster, they're a little more creative. Uh, but the point is, yeah, you've got to fire the bad customers because ultimately when a next round, look, at the end of the day, this is all about how do you get your next round, right? Because no one's gonna get profitable off this first round for an enterprise startup, at least for the most part. And uh, if you have a customer that's asking you to do custom one-off creations that, that don't help your product roadmap, here's a great example. A great example would be, you're hanging out with a customer and they ask you to build something and it's on your product roadmap for Q4 um, uh, and not for now. So you ask yourself, gee, you know what? That's on my roadmap anyway. I can close this customer and maybe I'll speed up that, that, that function or that feature. Um, but if someone asked you for something that is only specifically for them or maybe, you know, that has zero value for anyone else outside of that company, you have to say no. You've got to say no to that feature. And that goes back to my earlier point to like uh, Marty at Priceline. Like he's a guy that basically says, look, I will not ask you to build anything custom for me because 
once you start getting that custom path, they will not be able to raise their next round of funding, right? Because then you're then you're basically a professional services software development shop for someone else, right? You have to avoid that. You need to make sure that it's not a market of one, that it's a market of many each time you make that decision for what to uh, what to build for that first customer. And if and if it's not solving that that problem, then you got to just say no and fire them. Wonderful, well, thank, thank you. So we have a question from Jarek, who's a VP of sales from Poland. And he's asking, um, in terms of getting your first enterprise account in the US, does the strategy differ for European startups uh, compared to US based startups? Um, I would say no, uh, unless it's just basically a little bit harder. Um, so, so the one thing that, that I would uh, you know, think about though, is that if you are going after a larger organization, they're gonna think about how do I have um, local support or someone more local if it's a larger sale. So you might want to think about how do I, you know, here's like, like Pivotal Software, for example, um, when they first got out to market, I was an investor in Green Plum, which became Pivotal. But when they got their first few customers, uh, the product wasn't fully, fully baked, but they would send two or three engineers living on site to help kind of get that stuff implemented to work. So if you're in, in Poland, and you have someone super, super interested, and they're asking about global support, you'd be like, look, I'll send one of my folks over and they'll, they'll, they'll live, you know, they'll be close enough where they can answer your problems uh, quickly, right? And obviously in the world of COVID, it's a little bit different, but you know, pre-COVID, it's basically like I could just send someone, we could spend two weeks, three weeks, four weeks living with you to solve that problem. Wonderful. So now we're joined by Ian. Um, Ian, if you could please introduce yourself and then ask your question. Hi, this is Ian from Ireland. Um, kind of going back to the, the point you made there about partnerships. Um, we have a, we're building a, a SaaS communications platform for companies to manage um, projects, customers and teams. Originally, when we first came up with our, you know, our, our, our brand for our project, um, we found out that a potential customer owns that domain, but they're not using it. So from your point of view, if somebody came to you and said, we'd like to make contact with them, we'd love the domain, we want to work with them, offer them a service, how would you recommend we approach that? Uh, uh, you mean they own the domain, meaning, can you give me a, a more specific example? I'm, I'm not understanding. The yeah, question. so... Um, the, the platform is to is to connect different okay. people, create teams, create projects so that they can communicate to kind of, you know, so they can focus on specific problems or, you know, whatever their, their business is about. Yep. The, the branding that we were working on is to do with the word connect. Okay. The, when we did the search to see who owned the domain, a number of domains, one of them came up as a large multinational company that has offices in probably 50, 60 places around the globe that could potentially use a platform like us. Okay. But they own the domain. They're only using it as a redirect right now. Okay. So we think there's a potential to work with them and see if they'd be interested in letting us work with them on the basis of giving us the domain, we give them a service. Yeah, so so usually you need to figure out who is the owner of that domain. A lot of time it's it's legal, right? So I I would just kind of try to figure out kind of how do we you know get who owns the domain? Okay, God. So you should just figure out every way which way possible to reach out to them to see if you can strike a business relationship and 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 figure out how you can maybe barter for services or or something like that, right? Um, you know that that's the best thing I can tell you. Okay, thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Ian. And just as a reminder for everyone, if you have any questions, please click the raise hand button. All right, wonderful. So now we will take a question from Peter. Hi, Ed, it's Peter Parks from Qualdesk. Um, in the context of a bottom-up uh, POC or kind of sales opportunity, and I guess I probably used the the, the killer wrong word there, but um, in terms of the, you, you touched on this a little bit in that kind of sales versus partnering uh, discussion earlier, but I just wonder in the context of a bottoms up situation where you, you perhaps you've got into one team and you want to get to team two or team three or team five, what are some of the best and worst approaches you've seen to kind of make that leap from a kind of organic evangelism perspective? 
Yeah, so, so I think the most important part is that your product has to kind of lead the adoption, um, you know, and so I'll give you a good example, like uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, I remember that, uh, you know, a friend of mine was heading up sales there. They ended up having eight different kind of groups within, you know, a large bank using it before that person, uh, the sales rep went to kind of the CIO and said, hey, I can save you a ton of money because of this. Um, we recently had Kristen Haybacht, who is head of uh, uh, one of the heads of enterprise sales at Atlassian. Before that, she was head of enterprise sales at Trello. And once again, what she did was that she um, uh, would, would map out, literally, like, let's just say there's four different groups in an organization and show up with a map and saying, hey, like, you know, you're already spending this much money here. Like, why don't we, why don't we talk about something bigger? So I guess my point is that you can't force one group to another group, to be honest with you, the product has to do it. Like you can only do it after you have two or three or four groups going and hit the top down piece. So you need to organically build that in your product. Um, and you know, if, if it's frictionless, if there's um, viral hooks in it or ways to share dashboards or whatever that is, it has to be product driven first, to be honest with you. And then you can go in once a few teams are using it, but you can't go in up, up at the top unless you know someone really, really well and say, hey, one group's using it, and once you have 50 groups using it, right? It has to start with the product. So we have a, so, um, we have an anonymous question, Ed, which, but it touches on something that, that, that we think about a lot. And, and the question kind of, it talks about budgets and, you know, how to think about enterprise budget cycles, who has a budget, I need to have a fraud. If I'm selling something, I need to make sure I know who owns that budget. I need to make sure there is a budget for it, right? And sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm inclined to say, well, if it's that valuable and from the partnership perspective you spoke with earlier, you build those partnerships, they will find a budget, they will figure it out eventually. And sometimes I feel like, well, actually, no, that stuff is pretty important. If there's no budget, there's no budgeting. Like, what is your advice to founders when they start to think about identifying the budget line item and figuring out the budget cycles and the budgeting process and timing of stuff like that? it can become overwhelming if you're trying to figure out your own product and someone else's budget process at the same time, uh, right? Yeah, I'll give you a great example. I mean, first of all, you need to know what general category you're in, but I remember a uh, security scorecard when we invested in the company and what they do is they provide uh, third party vendor risk uh, rating, security ratings, so that, you know, the belief is that you're only as secure uh, as your partners who are touching your systems. And, you know, clearly the budget is going after security. Um, and the other budget could be going after vendor risk management for the people kind of analyzing that. But, you know, there's no budget for this company, right? <laughs> there's no line item at all, right? So a lot of times you're creating new categories, there's no line item, but you know the broader kind of perspective of where it is. And, um, you know, it took three or four years before Gartner even recognized the ratings category as a budgeted line item. So my point is that, so what we did is we sold to the CISO. And we know the CISO has discretionary operating budgets, operating numbers, right? The, the, there is a discretionary pocket of capital that they might use for people, they might use for other things. So what we did was we went and convinced them that they would need less people if they used our product. So it came out of their people operating budget, um, you know, from that perspective. And we showed that we could help um, security folks do more with less, right? So that, that was kind of the point. And then, so a lot of times you create new categories you know the general pocket of budget, but there's no line item. It's not like a line item for firewall, you know, or you know, network security or something like that. So you got to think about what other pockets are there, and there's always different pockets. There's a people pocket, right? So how do you help people do more with less? Because uh, a lot of times they still have lots of open recs to hire people and just came and find them. So if you can get some of that out, which goes back to my point earlier. Um, you know, maybe someone costs, you know, $150,000 as a full-time kind of equivalent and you charge them 25K and put three of your best engineers in who are better than any talent they could ever get to help build some software that they really need. That's a, that's a strong, strong sale and value proposition going back to the, the design partnership story. Um, hmm. So I guess the point is that there's a lot of times there isn't a budget, especially for new categories, but there is discretionary dollars at work and you need to know how to ask for it. And on a related note, we, we have a company in our portfolio that you know, we'll come back to us and say, well, we have, our, our product is relevant to multiple departments or there are multiple potential buyers for this product. And they've actually had VCs tell them, well, we don't want to invest in you because we can't identify a single buyer, right? Yep. And the company's like, well, this, this shows that we have a huge category and a huge potential in many ways of getting to market and lots of potential customers. And sometimes they're getting a message that, well, if you don't have one buyer, you know, you're not, you're clearly not focused enough. How do you, 
how do you think about that in specific, sort of that kind of question specifically with multiple buyers? And as a VC, how do you think about the buying budgeting dynamic, or do you look at just the product and the founders and, and you'll, you figure that stuff will work itself out? Yeah, I think that's a great question though, um, because I think about how many decision makers are there and where does it, where does the dollars come from? Like for example, like in, in M0's case, right? There's a uh, head of cloud, there's head of infrastructure, there's head of DevOps, um, you know, there's uh, sometimes head of security, right? And so I think the first thing we need to think about is who are you selling to? Like, where's the value proposition as a product for? And then who has the budget, right? And so, you know, for us, I think we narrowed it down to, it's gotta be the head of DevOps, they have the budget, but it's gonna have approvals from, you know, maybe security and finance, right? So so I think what, what scares people sometimes is that when there's multiple departments or groups to go after, it says that you're not focused or the value proposition's not tight enough. And then two is, it's just that the decision-making process will take too long. The more people that are involved in a decision, the longer it will take to get an answer, right? And so I've seen so many times where, you know, a company comes in and sells some infrastructure product, but they, you know, security needs to, needs to approve it, or maybe it comes up partially out of the security budget, right? And that, that becomes a big problem. So, you know, if you constrain who the buyer is and how many decision makers there are and, you know, by the department, I think it makes it much, much easier to, to start that way and then eventually expand over time. Uh, how, how early should a company start thinking about sales repeatability and, and how do you know that you've got it? I think about kind of, well, how early they should think about it. I, you know, the, the first, you know, four, five, six customers usually comes from relationships or, or, or people that they know. Um, sales repeatability in my mind is, is super important and you know, you don't have to have that proven for an A round, uh, depending on what, who you are, what category you're going after and what your software is. Um, but I think about it when you get your first, you know, five to 10 kind of cold, uh, inbound kind of, um, uh, relationships, you know, and, and close those deals. Um, I think it, it is, is a good sign that you actually, that your content marketing machine is working you know, that some of your, your marketing is working, that, that people are coming inbound that don't know you, right? And, and so I think when you expand from the people that know you to the people that don't know you, um, and then you can kind of quantifiably say, like, as I invest dollars here in, in marketing, my, you've got to look at your funnel, right? I'm investing dollars here, and this is kind of everything that's producing, and then eventually here's a sale. Um, but yeah, it's a much longer question, I guess, is the answer. Awesome. We're now joined by Amit. So Amit, if you could please introduce yourself and then go ahead and ask away. So hi, Ed. Um, this is Amit Karen from CyberMed in Israel. Um, thanks for all the great points. I think you, you related to most of my question uh, uh, just now in what Gil asked. So maybe just add a, a short point there. Uh, if you recognize a pain, but it is not within anyone's KPIs, would you still uh, pursue it? or would you try and reframe it at a different time or, or different way? I would make sure that uh, an audience of one is not the answer. So maybe make sure that you have talked to enough people, maybe talk to 20 people. And if 19 of 20 people don't think the pain is, is big enough, then maybe it's not the right thing. But if it's, you know, 10 people think it's big enough and 10 don't, then maybe it's still worth pursuing, right? Depending on how big the opportunity is. So I, I guess it just depends on how many people you talk to, right? Just because, you know, sometimes if you're only talking to a few folks, they may have other priorities or, or other things that are top of mind for, for reasons that we don't even know. Yeah, that, that, I fully agree. The question is, as you said, for new things, they don't have KPIs defined. So how, how would you frame it um, in that case, even if you have, let's say, 10 go-aheads? Um, well, from, from my perspective, it would be that there's no KPIs defined. Um, you know, you need to understand how, how much of a, what priority, where, where does it fit? You know, is it a priority one, two, or three, or is it kind of eight, nine, or 10? Will they get to it in the future? You know, a good question could be, for example, like um, I've seen probably six or eight companies doing security for AI models. And, you know, we reached out to some of the top leading organizations out there in the forefront of machine learning. They said, hey, uh, we know it's a problem, but it's not even on our top 10 list, right? So the question is, is are you too early now? um or or not right so so i think you need to understand where it fits in their priority bucket um and how long do you think that will take and you need to start with the most mature organizations for example uh who are at the forefront to figure out if it's even on their radar or not because it's going to take a lot a lot longer for the laggards to kind of catch up to that and you need to make the, make a decision around that super thanks a lot great thank you we'll now be joined by robert 
Hi, everybody. Robert down here from Brazil, Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm the creator of Decimals. I'm the CEO. And a question I have is around like creating the bottles up motion for a product that's pretty strategic. Like how can you kind of create a developer, generate value for developers uh, so that so that you can get into the enterprises? Like say for a product like Stripe or Alpha Zero, like these are like big project, big uh, structural projects for enterprise. Um, do you have any thoughts on how can you generate value for developers so they start using it and maybe think of uh, using it for their work? Yeah, so, so I think about uh, that question as uh, where are all the developers located right now? Um, and I think about it like open source as a good mechanism for marketing. Um, and so I, I think that you've got to find a narrow, narrow kind of problem that you're solving uh, to help developers do something faster, better, or easier. Um, and I think if you can leverage kind of some open source capabilities, um, you know, get some product out there, you know, a lot of people go to Hacker News and, and throw some stuff out there. And it's, it's repeat, this, this takes time to do. I just want to remind you that, I mean, it even took Sneak a, a couple of years to even evangelize kind of uh, why uh, uh, security was important for developers, right? So it's going to take some time to kind of build that motion up, but you need to go where, where the communities are. Or for example, let's just say I'm doing something, something in infrastructure as code, you know, well, guess who, what people think about it. They think about HashiCorp. HashiCorp's got a big open source kind of community there. Maybe you can think about what framework or what kind of little product can I kind of push out to that community to make it easier for them to do something, right? So I think you got to start really, really small and go where uh, existing um, developers are, you know, communities and target them. Uh, and then from there, you can start, you know, building your own name um, and get your, you know, and, and go from there. Cool, thanks. Awesome. We're now joined by Iran. Iran, if you could please introduce yourself. Hey, Ed. my name is Aaron Globiner. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, Aspecto, an Angular Ventures company. Um, we're an early stage company um, in the world of uh, um, developer tools for microservices. Um, and my question is mainly around uh, positioning. Um, often when we, when we develop something new, we don't, we, we, we don't find ourselves into um, uh, a known bucket or a known category, like you know, monitoring or logging or whatever. Um, so how much you would recommend to, um, in a sense, force ourselves to be in a known bucket so it would be easier for, for the target customers to, um, to understand what budget to allocate, to understand where you fit compared to saying, hey, I'm doing here something new. I'm not replacing anything. I'm creating something new here. I think that's, that's a question that you need to think about is like, are you creating a new category and uh, if so, does that really make sense? Um, or, you know, are you actually just uh, making something better that exists today? Um, I mean, from my perspective, I mean, I love creating new categories. And the, only, the, the trick, though, is just making sure you understand that there's a broad enough budget from which you can go after. I mean, if you have a key value proposition where you understand what the pain is and you know where the pain is, it doesn't matter what category you're in because you're seriously, I guess I don't want to confuse yourself with thinking about categories right now. Think about the pain, like here's a pain, no one's solving it. And usually, you know, the best companies are um, companies that are going after do it yourself problems. Like a lot of the biggest problems in the, as you know, in the tool space and the developer tool space uh, are, are kind of large companies kind of piecing things together themselves, right? Do it yourself. And yeah. you're coming in and kind of automating that and piecing it together, right? So, you know, I would focus more on the pain and the problem, especially in the early days versus the category itself. I mean, you know what category is. I'm a developer tool. You're probably increasing developer productivity, right? I mean, that, that's pretty much pretty general in there. There's yeah. money for that. So, so focus on the pain itself and, and why kind of they can free up their resources to uh, have their engineers build something different, right? More customer facing stuff versus building their own infrastructure to, to onboard developers or do things like that. And, and then, then you'll figure out the answer over time. Um, but you know, it, it's not for the faint of heart. It takes time to build a new category. I told you that security scorecard, that security ratings category took three or four years for Gartner to even recognize it. Uh, and that's fine. That's exciting. That, that's what makes like our job so exciting is that creating these new categories, but you have to know it's going to take time. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. We're now joined by Peter. Peter, if you could please introduce yourself. 
Yeah, hi, I'm Peter Gross. I'm the founder of uh, Horizon PPM. It's a project portfolio management tool. Um, I also come from a, a long background of working in large enterprises, um, investment banks and companies, etc. Now my target market. Um, my question is about um, credibility. Um, so credibility of the, the team and the product is absolutely key when um, these large corporates are buying from um, startups. The question in particular is about, I, I, I've got a conversation later this week with a, a colleague that I worked with many years ago, he's an experienced sales manager. He's sold large scale products into um, these sort of investment banks and, and other enterprises before, um, as potentially joining me on my venture. Um, do you think that clouds the argument having that sort of person on board in the early stages? Because, you know, there's a lot of talk about it should be the CEO because that's how he gets the best feedback directly at the front line um, or having a sales manager in there in the early stages. Would that also work? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think what your question really is, is that, you know, people buy from people they trust. And if you have someone that has lots of connections, let's just say, for example, selling into uh, the investment banks and the decision makers there for 15 to 20 years, then, you know, by all means, you should have someone kind of there helping you open the door uh, but of course, it's going to be you closing the deal with with that person. I mean, that person's going to open the door. You're going to come in and, and talk about your vision and the product, um, and then they'll probably help you execute that sales contract. But if if that's helping you open the door, do everything you can to open the door. And you know, a lot of times, to be honest with you, we may not even hire that person. We just might do a consulting contract for a few months and pay them a commission or something uh, to get started to see see how that goes. But the point is, is yeah, if you can find out ways to open the door in your top down sale. Uh, and you can build trust faster, then great. But you have to still be able to sell that vision and product uh, yourself. So I lost you a little bit there, but yeah, I think that th I, I think we're in agreement. I think you know the the thing really that you uh, is that my own thinking was you know maybe do it on a commission only basis or something like that, just to see how it works out without any commitments on either side. Um, is probably the right way because uh, that way I can leverage it without any. Uh, unnecessary baggage as it were as we go forward until we're all happy what, with what, where it goes exactly because a lot of times what happens is if you hire let's just say a top-down kind of uh, person you know six months later your product might have changed and you might have a different type of product maybe it's bottom yeah. up now so it's too too early to make those decisions unless you get a few folks um, using your you know buying buying from you brilliant thanks very much i'd appreciate that yep wonderful we're now joined by bensi Hi, I'm Bensi, uh, the founder of Perflow, and um, my question relates to um, when you're approaching for a pilot um, and setting up KPIs um, and you're still validating your use case for the product. So you, let's say you're a productivity tool and you want to uh, say that, oh, we'll increase productivity by 20% or 30%, but that's not proven out. Is it a risk? creating these KPIs that are, that potentially you won't meet, um, you know, and, and you're managing expectations. You're taking a big leap of faith by, by putting a quantifiable number. Yeah, I would say that productivity is one of those things that's super, super hard to measure in a, in a way, to be honest with you. Um, and that's a hard sale. I mean, everyone's trying to sell this productivity sale. Um, are there other metrics that are, you know, very clear and there's no debate over that you can actually, um, you know, talk about it? Maybe is it number of, I don't know, contracts processed? I, I don't know what kind of productivity tool you have, number of conversations had, or just something else that's more of a tangible metric versus, you know, I say, you know, or if you can actually truly say, like, if you're an RPA player and you can actually truly say, the, say that you saved X hours of time uh, with a bot, Right. So I'm just trying to figure out something that is tangible. There's no argument about, you know, what the answer is and something that you can control and measure. Um, you know, I think that's that's the most important piece. But everyone sells a general productivity sale. But you actually have to narrow that down much further. Is there another unit that you can think about? Uh, thanks. Cool. Uh, just before we wrap it, there's one one more question that came up in the chat that I, I thought was pretty good. Um, Mark is asking, do you value depth of engagement with customers or number of engagement with customers? I know as, as a VC, you probably see companies coming to you with both things, but how do you, how do you weigh those? Yeah. Yeah. For me, uh, the most important thing I think about is, um, you know, kind of 
can this, what I want to understand is if a customer can live without this uh, product or not, right? So if you have 10 folks that maybe, um, you know, bought your product or are working with you, but then, you know, it's not a daily part of their life or it's not a must have, or, you know, I, I think it's more important to show that, you know, I'd rather have two or three kind of, you know, super interesting customers that are using this all the time and actually love and love the product and can't live without it, you know, that, that you make them a hero than having 10 where they just check in every couple of weeks and it's kind of there and blah, blah, blah. Because what that tells me is that, you know, maybe they'll be churned in the future or whatnot. So you, you got to get your first few customers who are absolute advocates for your product and love it. And so I think depth of engagement, depth of interest, you know, and if they're not like that, then figure out how you can make your product more valuable to them and learn from that because that is, that is the beginnings uh, of, right. of a great company. Right. It, it sounds, the more I listen to you, the more it sounds like relationship advice. Learn to listen, make them yeah. feel their pain, make them love you, love them back. Don't yeah. be too transactional. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, totally. Um, uh, Ed, thank you so much for, for the time. Thanks for going over time as well. Um, really, really enjoyed having you. Um, and, uh, uh, any of these founders who are coming through New York or even not coming through New York, I, I know Ed and Elliot and the team at Bullstart have looked aggressively for opportunities in Europe. Uh, we hope you would take your company to Angular as well, but we definitely recommend that you talk to Bullstart. They're, they're truly fantastic. And we were, we were thrilled to have you uh, here, Ed, uh, and look forward to many more years of working together. Thank you. Like, likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Thanks.